I was going to wait till I'd finished. Um, <laughs> and I, when I was research, looking into you, Dave, I, I see you received the Alan Moore uh, Award in 2018 for working alongside industry and government to highlight heat pumps. And I think that's a very um, amazing thing to have got that award, a national award. So uh, we're very lucky to have you with us tonight. And we're looking forward very much to hearing what you have to tell us about um, the opportunity to here in Orkney. Thank you. Um, Over so, to you. Right. Uh, more accustomed to Teams. There we are. Share screen. Let's have that one there. Yes, you mentioned you mentioned the radio. Um, Hugh Hugh phoned me up, and just as he said, in effect, go. A little bit of coffee went down the wrong way and I was coughing the whole time, trying desperately not to cough. It was a good job. It was radio, not TV, because I think I was going purple on the face. Uh, but I survived and, um, yeah, hopefully edited it down and into something useful. Um, so can you see my screen? Thumbs yes. up. Thank you. So, um, gosh, how far back to go with this? I remember um, a beautiful sunny day stood on the hill hilltop over Kirkwall with, with Neil Kermode uh, chatting about all things uh, renewable energy uh, in Orkney, uh, having flown in and it was just idyllic. Um, and of course, all this uh, uh, activity, both the uh, wind and also the tidal stuff um, is just amazing. It's, it really is. Um, the centre of the universe as far as renewables goes in, in my book. And, and we were chatting about heat pumps and, and what to do and what the options were and so on. And at the time, I think we, we were probably, oh, it'd be about 2016. And we'd done a really big job in Norway. It uh, started about 2008, 2009. It was commissioned in 2010. And I then spent the next six years thinking, this is going to be really easy. We've cracked it. We, we can deliver heat at really high temperatures, uh, 90 degrees C. It was the, uh, the 2007 International Energy Agency report had said that um, uh, ammonia as a working fluid was very promising, but wouldn't go above 70 degrees C. And uh, that's, that's definitely not a challenge to, to throw down to to folk like us because we'll, we'll say oh yes we can and uh, we did um, and so this story sort of rumbles forwards from that as to um, what makes heat pumps happen um, a really interesting loop around Kirkwall and and uh, the, the the backup uh, power plant that's got water abstraction and of course the the the, the number of heat pumps and I think if this isn't true, I'd like it to be true, but the, there are more heat pumps per head of population in Orkney than anywhere else in the UK uh, and similar numbers uh, for, for electric cars. And if it's not true, I, I, I wish it were, but certainly um, somebody told me that once. Um, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll take it as the truth, Neil. Um, and uh, so, you know, how, how do you make them happen? So uh, enough uh, wittering in the intro for me, but I, I am now a group sustainable director, um, sustainable development director for Star Refrigeration, uh, which is a UK uh, industrial refrigeration company. Probably up until 2008, uh, we were uh, better known for freezing fish and ice rinks and data centers and um, uh, Greg sausage rolls, all, all sort of useful known things. And then we, we stumbled into heat pumps. So. This is part of that story and also maybe uh, to try and promote some, some critical thinking, I suppose, around uh, the, good, the good folk up there. Um, I'm going to start with a, a dictionary conundrum, um, threat and opportunity, um, two words well known to each of us. And uh, I hope I'll maybe uh, finish up uh, answering that. Is it a threat or an opportunity? This whole um, climate change piece, of course, um, the world and the Doug are coming to Glasgow, um, although there's going to be a rail strike, apparently. But anyway, the, the world and the Doug are coming to Glasgow um, in, oh gosh, how many? Well, about seven weeks. And um, I saw this cartoon a long, long time ago, um, probably 2010, and it just really struck me because back at the time, um, we were dealing still in, the, in, in the, the era of naysayers. And I suppose there still are a few now, um, there's still a few folk think the earth is flat, but that's another story. But, um, you know, what if 
you know, what if it's a big hoax and then you've got the stuff all down the side? The bit that I'd never really thought about, and it's not so pertinent in, in Orkney, I don't think, but um, clean air um, is, is certainly a problem in the, in the big cities. You've, you've, you've got plenty of wind up there and not nearly as much traffic. So it's not quite a problem, but just really the, the diversity. Um, green jobs is something that's been touted about, especially uh, more recently, because of course, this last uh, two months has been devastating. This is a cartoon, obviously, much more recent. Um, but behind COVID, we've got the, the looming recession. Furlough finished last week. Um, goodness knows what's going to happen next to businesses and then climate change. And you know, we fairly quickly heard people talking about building back better. Uh, and, and I'm not a fan necessarily of these cliched terms, but um, there's definitely got to be something in it. What if we can... What if we can uh, tackle climate change and uh, create prosperity? Off. Not off. Hello? I can hear you, Dave. Sounds like somebody's not got their uh, thing on mute. We'll, uh, Mark will hunt them and, and find them. Car carry on, Dave. Okay. Um, so, and uh, this uh, data that, that's been gathered for years and years, not the most uh, picturesque. The, the, there's also a chart, the, the, the day that the cherry blossom appears in a park in Tokyo is my favourite. And that's been happening earlier and earlier every year as recorded since the year 500 or something. So it's indisputable that something is going on and it's uh, pretty clear that um, burning stuff is the problem in, in my mind. For whatever, for whatever um, uh, thing we're burning or doing, it's, it's that. So pinch this uh, sketch from uh, European Heat Pump Association. Um, and I, I pick out the two that I think are, are, are locally the biggies in terms of local jobs and clean air, but um, obviously renewable energy and supply security. You know, every day there's, there's something else that just keeps pointing back to, we need a new energy paradigm. And uh, so, where does that take it? Well, heating, obviously, it's the, it's the big piece um, still uh, overlooked, in my opinion. Um, everybody wants to talk about transport or electricity production. And yet, it's, it's hard to get exact data, but uh, certainly over 30% of the, the UK's um, emissions are coming from um, heating, uh, principally burning gas, uh, those on-grid, uh, oil, off-grid, or LPG. Um, and, you know, people try and solve this problem as if it's just, a, we, know, we, we know what the challenge is, how are we going to solve this? But, of course, there's, there's different segments, and that's the purpose of this diagram. There's at least eight that I've picked, and probably more, and they're, they're all kind of similar, you know, certain overlaps between them. Um, but I think it's useful to, to uh, slice and dice and start thinking about them separately. As we as we ponder through it, um, I suspect I'm I'm uh, preaching to the choir here in terms of what a heat pump is. As I said earlier, the the, the numbers in Orkney uh, are quite high, but basically, um, it's a refrigeration system. It it does uh, make the, the 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 hair in the back of my hand stand up uh, when people say it's refrigeration in reverse. It's not. We're still cooling down in one place and moving that energy to the warm place. What's perhaps in reverse is we're looking at the warm bit instead of looking at the cold bit inside the fridge. Um, but we're still applying work and moving heat uphill, hence the name heat pump. Um, it's an odd, an odd name, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite descriptive, actually, when, when you stop and think about it. So like a water pump that's pumping water uphill, a heat pump is pumping heat up that temperature hill. Um, now, you can cool down pretty much anything and uh, the heat can be used for for lots of different things and that's evolving all the time so um first segment and this uh, I, i'm actually really annoyed that this is still part of this sort of um chatter because we really ought to have stopped building brand new houses that have fossil fuel as a heating source i you know it's um you, you've got to you've got to go off the bus um first of all um you could draw all sorts of um, analogies to uh, Weight Watchers or anything more um, dramatic than that. But, you know, we've got to stop doing the thing that we know is wrong in the new stuff we're building. And in fact, the heat demand in a brand new house ought to be really low anyway. So um, 
still picking up the tulips from uh, the European Heat Pump Association. So I've planted some of them in the garden just to remind us about the variety of opportunity. But just stop building new stuff the wrong way uh, is, is the first bit. And it just needs policy to do that. Um, slightly worrying that the, the, the UK and Scottish governments are saying uh, 2025 we'll stop build, we'll stop putting gas boilers. Actually, I think the legislation probably says we'll stop uh, granting building warrant applications or approving building warrant applications. Of course, anybody that's built a house or run a development knows you've got three years. And of course you can apply for an extension. So I suspect we might still, if somebody really wanted to see um, gas boilers going into new build properties, a way out towards 2027, 2028, which is really, really quite annoying. Um, of course, stuff that was built a few years ago, um, we, we, we've got to fix that as well. And where it's standalone and you know accepting um, grid supply issues, uh, putting an individual heat pump in a property is, is a fairly good way of doing it. Unfortunately, the, um, the funding schemes for that are A, slightly confusing and B, um, going backwards. Um, so what I think that we'll need to see is some sort of heat as a service where a third party company um, uh, says to a homeowner, and it might be a standalone home like this, or it might be part of a, a larger housing estate, but how do you fancy a heat pump? We'll install it and it will be so many pounds per month and we'll take care of all the, all the hassle. I think going around it one by one by one is going to be hard yards, as the Yanks would say. Um, Industrially, and I've picked this just to represent whiskey, and we, we had some um, conversations with various uh, whiskey distilleries over the years, but this is, it could perhaps be the perfect opportunity for a heat pump. We put heat in, the, in at the bottom of the still around about 120, 130 degrees, and we capture the heat at the top of the still in the, in the cooling part where the vapor is recondensed to uh, liquid spirit, and uh, the heat gets thrown away. So a heat pump would capture that heat as a heat source for that. All you need is a heat pump that goes to 120, 130 degrees. Now these now exist. So that would be a really interesting thing. And the calculations we've done suggest that uh, one unit of electricity would run this system, uh, giving four units of heat required. So you would drop the energy consumption by uh, 75%. Of course, you'd be switching from one fuel to the other and electricity can be more expensive. But private wire electricity plus a heat pump would be a quarter of the running cost of private wire direct electricity into the still. Or if, if you uh, if chose to make hydrogen and then put that into the still, which would be approximately 75% uh, efficient, it would be even, even that would be a one in six ratio versus that. So great opportunity for heat pumps there, but not really the topic of tonight. So... I picked these slides up from something I'd done earlier. Apologies, it's been very busy, but this is Dumfries. Uh, I won't uh, turn it into a pub quiz and see who knows where that is. The River Nith. Um, but it's a, a fairly typical uh, town, uh, not, not dissimilar to, to Kirkwell or Stromness. Um, fairly low, low rise, um, mixture of older buildings and newer buildings. But how are we going to get the situation where we get heat, heat networks there? Um, because when you've got a relatively high density of buildings, it becomes slightly less practical to put an individual heat pump in every building for a couple of reasons. One, where do you get the heat from? Two, if it's an air source heat pump, where does the cold air go? You can't have too much of it blowing about because it creates a sort of microclimate. And three, um, the electricity supply, having every building um, using much more electricity is going to create some questions for the grid whereas a central heat pump uh, might be better. So if it's district heating, the question then is, how do you get district heating to turn up in a town? Um, what, what came first, the chicken or the egg, the district heating or the, or the heat pump? Um, so it's all about creating a demand for this. There's some work going through the Scottish government. Um, it's principally aimed at creating the, the rules of the game for, for district heating, which is great. It doesn't actually say very much about how you create the customers for the game or the customers for the sport. So um, I think what we'll also need to see are the local authorities saying, in this zone, we really want you to move on to this stuff. Um, here's why you should do it. And there's a variety of ways they could do that, um, whether it's uh, through taxation or benefit or some, some sort of thing. But they have to create a, a, a suite of customers who are saying, 
you know, I, I would like to join district heating and then see where that goes. So that's a local policy regulation. And then the networks will emerge. Somebody will invest. So long as they're certain they'll get their money back. So what, what gives us the sort of inspiration and, and I suppose the, the credibility to talk about uh, big heat pumps from rivers and the sea? Well, well we did it um, 10 years ago um, in Drammen in Norway. It's uh, 40 kilometres west of Oslo. We were asked, uh, the client had an existing district heating network, but it was basically a mixture of gas and biomass and they wanted to decarbonize. So they said, well, could you do this? And we, we rose to the challenge and we did, uh, and that's been running um, uh, nine, 10 years now. Um, and it's it dropped the carbon footprint of what they were doing by approximately 98%, uh, which is super. Um, uh, but where, where next and, and how to bring that uh, closer to the UK. So this is this is really the sort of more up-to-date uh, chatter. This is from um, Clyde Bank. Um, this is obviously an artist depression. There's buildings, not, not the stuff in the background hasn't really been built yet. The stuff in the foreground has. That's the local college and the, there's a sports centre as well. Um, but that's now taking heat from the Clyde Estuary and we are delivering three units of heat for one unit of electricity and we are delivering heat at up to 80 degrees and I've said 45% um, uh, reduction versus gas but actually uh, if I dialed in a, a fairly uh, breezy day like today it might be over 90% lower carbon footprint than burning gas and of course as we were saying earlier there's zero local knocks from, from the, the facility when it's running in the heat pumps. And uh, yeah, landscaping is, has been done now. Uh, I must go back and get a more up-to-date uh, picture and heat pumps are installed. And uh, it's, it's great, it's there. Um, just they need to get more buildings connected and that will come with a little bit of uh, nudging and tickling of the, the local buildings that aren't in the control of the local authority and uh, they'll, they'll get them uh, onto it. And that's the what I've uh, <laughs> become accustomed to calling the twins. Uh, twin heat pumps, each 2.65 megawatts of heat, um, taking uh, salt water from the, from the estuary through this uh, heat exchanger, which has titanium tubes. The reason we use a tubular heat exchanger is it's automatically cleanable. And then we have a, a roughly about an 800 kilowatt motor uh, compressor and the, the oil separator and then heat recovery and all the oil management. So that has been installed and done. And then the question arose, well, just how would you assess a community? And I'd been asking this question around the sort of industry for a while. How much does district heating cost and how could you do it? And really, it was quite a complicated question because it comes down to a whole bunch of different factors. Um, first of all, knowing how big the system would need to be. And I bumped into some guys from a, a business uh, called Comsoft, and they they basically have software that it's um, I think they call it interspatial modeling, uh, uh, which which basically means they 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 have a, a GIS data map of all the heat demand in a community, and they work out how much is needed for each building, and then they work out the size of the pipes, and it draws it all back to the central point, and that then says you need. 10 megawatts or 15 megawatts or five megawatts, whatever it would be. And therefore you can work out the cost of the network. You can work out the cost of the heat pump. You can then put in the cost of the electricity to run the, the device. And that gives you a, a, an operating model and that, that translates back to a pence per kilowatt of heat. And then you can go to the buildings and say, if you were to join district heating, we think this is the offer we could make you. And so the buildings could pledge uh, to do that. And then if enough people pledge, as I was saying earlier, you, you have a, a chance of somebody saying, right, I'm going to build the thing now. So um, that's that's what makes the, the district energy happen uh, over and over. If you get um, low risk for the investors, make it predictable by harnessing sources of energy that you can see, touch and smell uh, more easily than than um, the than something that's a little bit riskier, making it repeatable, and of course, uh, generating that return on investment. Um, and in Glasgow, we, we modeled the whole city center, um, worked out in several 10 megawatt clusters, um, mapped the whole thing out, each little dot is the heat demand, um, worked out to be 47 kilometers of pipe, um, which is a, you know, a significant amount, but that's for the whole of the center of Glasgow. 
and uh, produces the business model. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about hydrogen in this piece, because um, I know there's been some good stuff done uh, up in Orkney, but this was a, a, a graphic from a, a gentleman called David Sabon, um, and basically what the, the danger is, is that we have this um, abundance of wind generated electricity, and we have a choice of what to do with it. And for certain uh, activities such as ferries, I think it's brilliant. And whether flight comes along remains to be seen, but that would be great too. Uh, but taking the hydrogen direct into the house, into a hydrogen boiler, one must be pretty careful about the efficiency of that because it's basically six times more effective so you could heat six times as many houses if you use the electricity through the grid for a heat pump, if it was an individual heat pump or central heat pumps for that. So um, to wrap it up, this uh, question, threat or opportunity, well, I kind of think it's a threat opportunity. If I can throw a new word into the, into the English language, um, I think we've got a brilliant opportunity uh, to, to turn this threat into a positive and uh, I hope what I've said is, is useful and helpful, but um, that's enough from me other than to say, I'd be very happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you very much, Dave. That was uh, brilliant. Um, wow. Actually, I was looking down, I, I'm involved in one of the buildings within that um, on a commercial thing, so I might be having a look at the Glasgow stuff, but that was, that was really good. Uh, I think we've had a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see that. Um, there was one uh, from Neil Commode, uh, which says distilling, would there be a minimum size for that heat pump? Um, sorry, I was reading the, the question from Robert Leslie. Um, so um, what was Neil's question, sorry? Distilling, would there be a minimum size for a heat pump? So. Um, I, I can't translate it into, um, you know, is it hectoliters per, per year or something, whatever the measure of a distillery is, but um, yeah, a re reasonable size, um, certainly uh, so somewhere, a, a malt distillery, yes, it doesn't need to be a grain distillery, for sure. Um, you know, something that had a 500 kilowatt uh, boiler at the moment would be a good size, I would say. Um, that that would uh, we'd be able to run that on 125 kilowatts of electricity, so you're getting four four times uh, four uh, bang for your buck, if you like. Um, and, and and it's the, it's the it's the relative cost. Um, you know, all fuels have a price, uh, but electricity has a choice as well. You can use it direct one to one, or you can put it in a heat pump and get uh, multiples out. Um, the reason it's um, it's worth saying why is why, how can you get 120 degrees from a heat pump with a COP of four when a domestic heat pump um, might have a COP of three or four itself? The simple answer is the grade the grade of heat that you're harnessing is much warmer. So air source heat pump you're taking heat out of air at let's say zero degrees C for the sake of argument, um, but with the heat recovery from a distillery you'd be recovering the heat at more like 70 degrees. So you're much, much further up that hill, although the hill ends up being slightly taller. And of course, using different working fluids, um, we'd probably do those heat pumps with butane or, or pentane, um, but the hydrocarbons tend to be really quite efficient as, as a working fluid. Thank you. Um, actually, can I just say to everyone, if you want to put your screens on, that might be quite nice and you could actually ask your own questions. Um, Alan, do you want to ask yours? Robert, I mean, sorry, I got that from. Robert? Sorry, yeah, I mean, mine was really just a, a statement as uh, Dave was talking about why folk are not switching right away for gas to uh, the heat pumps or, or something else, because that was just me experiencing the workshop today that, um, you know, folk in the centre of it are saying, no, we're not going to move away until. Uh, 
you know, they find the solution to the, the, the price of electricity, which <laughs> may involve removing these tariffs. Um, yeah, so, so that was really it. Uh, but I would guess that a sort of district heating uh, system like uh, we've just seen uh, explained this might be an answer to, to that, really. There's something badly wrong with the electrical grid and the, the management of it. Um, we have situations where we have curtailment um, localised and, and it's not possible for a utility. And there might be some different rules in Orkney, so forgive me if I'm not totally up to speed because it's, it's a special place, as I was saying. But in the mainland, it's not possible, for example, around Glasgow to be uh, selling uh, electricity at a lower price than it would be nationally, despite the fact that Whiteley's wind farm is not spinning because they've bid to be the uh, the curtailed uh, entity. Now, and most folk have heard of Octopus Energy by now, but um, variable pricing to me shifts demand so that somebody switches their, their car to, to charge at the right price. They run their heat pump at the right price. They might have a thermal store. So long as we, A, don't allow absolute flexibility in pricing, we're going to have a problem. But secondly, and you say, you say it in your answer, and I'll say I'll put a little bit more on it. Every, every wind tower that has been constructed more recently has been bid at roughly five pence per kilowatt hour for the production of electricity. But by the, so 50 pounds per megawatt hour. But by the time you buy it 100 meters down the road from the electricity grid, if you were contracting just now with any of the providers, they'd be wanting 20 pence. So you can make it for 5p, but it costs 20p just down the road. That's crazy. That's a broken system, in, in my opinion. And part of that uh, uplift are, are all the taxation charges. And, and people uh, point to a graphic that's been used that says the, uh, the social and environmental charge in electricity is 23%, and on gas, it's only 2%. But the bit that you also have to calculate is what is the relative carbon footprint and the relative cost of each of these? And when you work it out, it's 60 times as expensive to create a ton of CO2 emissions with electricity as it is with gas. So gas is really getting away with, um, well, quite frankly, getting away with murder in terms of the pricing policy. Um, and until, and I, I did a paper for, for Scottish Enterprise, my concluding line was, the barriers are, are, are paper-based, but paper-thin. Mm -hmm. Somebody with a magic pen in government could write this new legislation that says all heat pumps will get electricity at six and a half P for the sake of argument. So a little bit for grid transmission charges, provided you don't use it between uh, 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. because that's tea time and everybody's making fish fingers and a cup of coffee. So it's going to be fixed at some point. Otherwise, we'll spectacularly fail. But I completely agree with the, the, the comment made earlier, but... Um, I think it's um, it's a, it's a policy thing rather than do heat pumps work thing. Um, very frustrating. Um, there's another question here, Mick Wyatt. Uh, don't disagree with the efficiency of heat pump over H2 gas boiler set up. The missing piece here is the energy storage aspect given the intimacy of, rain, of wind. Absolutely. Um, I can only say two, two things about that. One is, gosh, I wish there were far more tidal devices on the, uh, <laughs> on the network that would... And, and so when you take wind and solar and tidal, then you know, can you still get, as the Germans call it, a dunkel flout, at, um, a, a dead cam or a dark cam? Um, it's far less likely. Um, should we be um, ever curtailing wind? Absolutely not. Should we be doing something with it? Absolutely yes. Should that be something that might be some form of chemical form of energy that could be then reused to bridge the gap? Absolutely yes. But that's entirely different from every day, 24-7, 365 of, of using stuff direct. So um, we must get into the bridging either by thermal storage or chemical storage or, or anything else that, that uh, I've not mentioned to, to bridge these lower pieces. What I would say, and it's an interesting piece, and going back to Queen's Key, we can switch that off in less than a second. And then we have a very large thermal store. I didn't point it out on the, on the picture, but the thermal store will last for about two hours. So we could, we could immediately switch off and use the thermal store. And so what you can effectively then do is have more renewables on the grid so long as 
the big heat pumps or the cars or the whatever else is, is, is more flexible switch off. And that leaves that depleted resource, that um, lesser resource on a less windy day available for the more critical uses, not to suggest that heating isn't critical, but um, on a time scale, it's much easier to move energy around for that. So I think that's going to be a really interesting piece uh, in terms of um, energy management. Um, so uh, the others haven't. Uh, oh, James has a question. Do you want to go, Neil? I can't remember what it was asked. I've been talking away to my ask content. I could read that out. Oh, that's all right. Okay. So um, the, the, I completely agree with your point about um, heating houses with hydrogen day. I think it's actually balmy that we pump houses, uh, pump premium fuels into what the um, uh, chair of the Committee of Climate Change, John Cummer, called crap housing, which we all agree with. Um, and it... And I, and I do take the point about the efficiency side of things. However, one of the, the, the space I do think that hydrogen might have is in the bulk energy transfer side of things. So if we electrolyze locally, pipe hydrogen, and then at the other end, turn the hydrogen back into electricity in a CHP, and then put the electricity into a heat pump, and there's a lot of conversion steps, but you, you do end up with a couple of hundred percent at the end, as opposed to the two seventy percent you were showing there, the big advantage seems to be, and um, others will probably have a better comment on this than I. But you can get something like forty times as much energy down a pipe as you can of a cable of the same diameter. So getting a getting a pipe all the way down the A nine and burying it would be a bloody sight easier than burying an irking big cable of the size of a manhole. So I I, I think I, that's the space. Personally, I think hydrogen will occupy, which will be as a transmission fluid, as a rather than actually at point of use at the other end. Yeah, I I, I tried to do some homework before coming on uh, and read some really great stuff from ORF's website, and then that took me some other links, and and it was fascinating. I, I wish I'd started about three days earlier. Um, I was trying to find out how much curtailed wind there is in Orkney, because of course we have to remember that curtailment happens for. Uh, at least three reasons. Um, but I was trying to find out just how significant it is because the challenge with some of the statements that I've seen from uh, Scotia Gas Networks, for example, and the, 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 the hydrogen for homes and, and, and Fife and so on, is, and some of the calculations, they're basically saying, we're going to make the hydrogen from freely available, otherwise curtailed wind. And it's nonsense. If you want hydrogen, you're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to pay for the electricity, and it's going to cost you the same as the next bloke down the road that wants to charge his car, and it'll be £50 per megawatt hour. Completely. And the other thing is it'll be a really rubbish return on capital invested if you only use these electrolyzers intermittently. We will absolutely see wind into electrolysis. Bugger the grid, just, just wind into electrolysis. I'm absolutely sure that's going to come. Um, in terms of the amount that's can tell, other people may know, but the, the figures are quite difficult to obtain because there are once again, a couple of elements with curtailed. One is different turbines are curtailed by different amounts by the current grid configuration and uses. But the other piece of curtailment that's not easily visible is the unbuilt stuff. The stuff that people simply don't buy because it, because you can't, you don't stand a cat in hell's chance of getting the energy away. So there's a lot of energy available that we've yet to tap. But getting that business model to work is key. I better shut up because I just barged in there. Well, I'll jump back up. Can I barge in a, uh, further, please? Um, in 2018, um, Community Energy Scotland had estimated that it was about 14.6% of the wind generation that was actually on the active network management system in Orkney that was being curtailed. Um, and as you, and that was part of the Orkney Energy Audit 2019, which um, I'm not sure if that has yet been published or not. However, um, well, as Neil said, you know, you have some um, uh, wind turbines that are facing much, much higher curtailment than that and others that barely face any. So it kind of averages out. Um, we estimated at about 14.6% in 2018. Can I ask a, a, a subsequent question then? What percentage of the cars in Orkney when that study were done were electric cars? What, what day was that, Evelyn? Uh, it was 2018. So that was probably about 200. 
150 cars. So that's probably about out of 15,000 vehicles. So a tiny, tiny percentage. So you switch on more cars to wanting electricity, but flexibly, and all of a sudden your curtailment definitely isn't the same number. It goes down, but I, I, as I was saying earlier, there's different reasons for it. Some of it is nodal, where uh, the grid has constraint points, and you guys will understand this better than me because you're living it every day. But to me, I would then say, well, fi fix the nodal constraint and put a you know bigger transmission cable and get the electricity to the bits in the islands that need it and have more people that want it flexibly and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the statements that you see in the present, Orkney has 106% of the electricity that it needs. Yeah, today, but not tomorrow or 10 years from now. You're going to need double, treble, whatever it might be. So there's some really interesting studies to be done. Maybe they've been done already and I'm not aware of them, but um, all, all stats are followed up with another one, I think is probably the rule. Um, yeah. I, I think if we could move to James Ferguson next. Uh, yes. yeah, okay. Just going to say that. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, on that point, we EMEC supervised three student projects on curtailment in the last 12 months. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on in that space. Um, this this might be a, 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 a quite a basic one for you. You sometimes hear that heat pumps don't work in drafty houses. Why do the people say that? Um, and is it true? I'm just really fascinated by that one. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of bits to unpack from that. Um, yeah, we, we have varying qualities of housing stock, um, all in the lower segments of European standards. So rubbish and even more rubbish, <laughs> the two main ones. Um, I, I stay in a, a 1950s bungalow that's, that's a little bit drafty. Um, the heat demand is, is nothing to do so much with the draftiness. It's um, the high heat demand probably means that the radiators are better served with warmer water, um, which is true. It's also true if you have a gas boiler. So the other way of answering it would be people say heat pumps don't work in uh, poorly insulated houses as well as they would do in better insulated houses, but neither do gas boilers. So... What we're always trying to do with a heat pump is reduce the flow temperature down. And that is easier to do if, um, you know, the, the, the heat that you get out from a one square meter radiator is a number. And that number is a function of the, the temperature of the water that's going into the radiator and the temperature of the room. So 21 degrees for the room and maybe 60 degrees, maybe 50 degrees, maybe 40 degrees. And the quantity of heat that you get out from a square meter gets less as the flow temperature comes down. So if your room needs five kilowatts of heat demand that you could achieve with a one square meter radiator if the water was 80 degrees, then that's great. But your heat pump is gonna be really choked and not work very well if, it, if it's trying to get up. In fact, domestic stuff won't go that high. It is possible to get higher temperature heat pumps now. I think that the industry has moved forwards, but you should always be very, very careful about running at um, higher temperatures than you actually need to. So with a, with a house, it's always advisable to, to uh, try and improve the insulation. So, and two things then happen. One, you need less heat, but two, that size of radiator could achieve the quantity you need. Let's say you get it from five down to two, you can achieve that with a lower temperature of flow rate. So you might get down from 60 to 50. And every degree that a heat pump is cooler in its flow temperature saves about uh, one and a half uh, percent. So you save 15% in the running cost just by going from 50 to 40. And so just keep trying to make it better. And then of course, uh, weather compensation is a technique that says don't run the water nearly as warm if it's not as cold a day. And you start playing tricks. And basically what it amounts to is it's dead easy to put a gas boiler in that runs really too warm, and it's much harder to do it right, which interestingly, uh, and it's an anecdotal statement, but apparently something like 80% of condensing gas boilers don't actually condense because the flow temperature of the water is turned up too high. So the first thing to do if you've got a gas boiler, before even thinking about a heat pump, and I'm not in the domestic space, it's just my personal experience from doing it, is the little dial that's got the radiator symbol turn it down a bit. And if your house, basically then you're, you're feeding water a little bit cooler, so there's a chance you might be condensing, which is where that device is really meant to be behaving. And you might 
uh, improve the, the, the consumption of gas by even as much as 10 or 15 percent, depending how bad it was to start with. So it's all about managing the system better rather than just, you know, it's it's sledgehammer to crack a nut would be, be the popular way of saying it. So I hope that gives you some sort of um, feel on it. Um, I'll, I'll say this, there is not a single building in Britain that could not be heated with a heat pump. There are some that are far easier and there are some that are really difficult. And there are some that really will only be done with district heating and big central heat pumps. But every single building in Britain could be heated with a heat pump of some shape, size, efficiency, blah, blah, blah. But you know, it's not a case of, oh, well, it's going to be quite tricky. I'm just going to keep burning gas. That's not an option. So who's uh, further down the list? Sandy here, I have a question. Hi. Hi Dave, that, <clears throat> thanks. That was really, really interesting presentation, and I totally agree with everything you were saying on domestic space heating. And I, I think heat pumps are the solution that's there at the minute, and I just think it's scandalous that it isn't being pushed harder. Um, but what I was wanting to ask you about, it's really interesting. Every year, I set students here a sort of task to look at district heating scheme for strongness and apply for some mythical sort of grant funding. And every year they sort of latch on to sea source heat pump because it's kind of the obvious thing to do when you look around at the options. And then when we do the costs every year, the thing that makes it a scary number is the, the pipe network going around the town. And um, fair enough, it's going to what they're doing is pretty sketchy and probably not up to date, but consistently that's the, the thing. So I guess my question was that, you know, are there technologies there that around that are going to make that aspect of it cheaper? Or is that just going to be a bullet that we have to bite and uh, subsidize or, 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 or whatever, as you say, you know, it requires a government intervention and the pen to make the decision. So, you know, is that sort of pipe network aspect of it, you know, have you got any ideas that the cost of that might be coming down or is it just a physical thing that has to be the way it is and, you know, that's it? Um, so there's there's a couple of bits in that. Uh, Nick Wyatt actually asks or makes a comment about the cost of putting stuff in the ground and saying, and this is for uh, medium voltage cables, 20% cable cost and 80% people on diggers. It's the same for pipe. Um, there is an emerging, you know, district heating, if that's the that's the question, there's, there's two emerging techniques that are interesting. One is um, classic medium or high temperature, nobody's ever sure what, what numbers to put in these, but um, warm enough that you can use it without doing anything else. So you just have a simple heat exchanger at each property. So let, for sake of argument, let's say seven, 70 degrees, and that would be um, plastic or steel pipe that's insulated and have a certain diameter, and you've got a delta across the network of say 40 degrees. So therefore you've got a size of diameter of bore. And so you've got a trench that needs to be a certain size and there's your number. The other way of doing it is to put an ambient network in where you pump 15 degree water around the community and cool it from 15 down to 10 with a heat pump in each individual property. And uh, science wise, absolutely, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way of doing ground source heat pumps without having to drill lots of boreholes. You're basically using a horizontal um, way of doing it. The challenge is that you still have to have an uprated electrical dip capacity at each property and that's the bit that's probably going to be hardest but the other bit that's worth saying is um a, a, a network that's got five or ten degrees delta across it compared to a network that's got 20 or 30 degrees is going to have more water being pushed around the pipe sizes will be bigger they might not be insulated but really frankly it's the cost of get getting the guy there in the jcb if the if the trench is you know a little bit narrower it's likely to be the same cost. So I suspect, and then you get into the social sciences bit of it, and a uh, big fan of um, Jan Webb at Edinburgh Uni, um, but she would talk about making it easy for the customer to say yes. And um, if the option to you is, do you fancy having a heat pump in the house or do you fancy having a heat exchanger in the house and, we'll, and no maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. I think the latter is probably right. So that isn't really an answer to your question other than to say, unless it's going to get cheaper to dig a trench at some point in the future, um, I don't see it. Um, I do ponder, particularly thinking about 
uh, really dense areas uh, and some of the district heating that's gone in in Glasgow, for example, at Strathclyde Uni has been horrifically difficult with all the buried services. I do wonder what we might borrow from the oil and gas industry with uh, directional drilling and, and, and stuff that's being dug at a deeper depth without, you know, so basically you've either got to feed it through like a mole or do an open, open trench. I don't think the industry has really looked enough at non- open trench type uh, deployment. Um, whether that's good for Stromness or not, I'm not, it looked a pretty rocky place when I was there, um, but I don't know. Um, so I think the short answer is, it's all about the digging. Um, doesn't matter what your pipes look like, um, but if you can find a cheaper way of getting stuff up underground, then yeah, you might be at the races. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Ian Johnson's had his question answered. Um, so David Craig next, please. Okay, right, you can hear me. Um, I, well, I've heard a lot about, uh, about waving a pen just to solve this. And what I was going to suggest is that go back to the beginning of your philosophy and and don't say we're trying to make the world a better place. Say we're trying to solve the climate crisis, that it's, a, it's, it's an overarching crisis that we have to face like a war and say our priority is to fix the climate, not to make the world a more equal place. And if you do that, then you say the way to fix this is to have a carbon tax so that everything is judged according to the carbon dioxide emissions that it produces. And you can take into account not only the cost of the, the gas, but also the, the cost, the carbon cost of building a heat pump or a district pump. But you have to abandon the idea at the beginning of saying, we're trying to make everybody equal. What we're trying to do is fix the carbon dioxide problem, which is the biggest problem facing humanity. It's, it's, uh, I almost uh, invite everybody to give that a round of applause because I totally agree with it. So uh, there, that's um, I, I, totally, um, you know, I, in fairness, my, my graphic was uh, going back 10 years and saying, what if it's a, what if it's a big hoax? Um, I don't believe it's a hoax. And I do believe that we need to um, put, put a fairly big stick behind the thing and shove pretty hard. So um, I, I can't see past... Um, carbon taxation of some sort, personally. Um, what the what the right uh, uh, number is, uh, you know, who knows? It seems to be rising uh, in the in the in the markets, which is a good thing. Um, but we've got to be very careful. I think if I if I can build on that, I think we have to be very careful about um, not leaving people behind and making people's lives worse. Um, and I think that comes back to the right business model. Um, you know, nobody, not many that I know, you know, I work with my brother and I can't persuade him to put a heat pump in his house um, yet. I'll keep trying. But um, even even the, the sort of um, uh, mentally converted um, struggle with it because it's expensive and, and so on. So we need a business model that, that creates an opportunity for everybody to say very easily, yes, please, and then let the business model and the companies providing that, um, and we're not the domestic market, so it's not a, a push for us, but let the the, the, the companies, that, whether it's the utility companies, it might be E.ON or, or Scottish Power or whoever, deploy these solutions. And then what you'll see is the right quality of solutions as well. Um, you, you've made an excellent point in your question that was, that was typed up about... Um, uh, fan assisted radiators yeah it's brilliant we can do lots and lots of clever things to make the whole thing run better and and somebody who is committed to providing heat to a house at a fixed price will start uh, turning over all the rocks they can to get better yeah. performance yeah i like that so um where did we get to um so next up i think it's neil commode Oh God, what was I talking about? Um, uh, Orkney Hospital. Hospital. Yeah, yeah Dave. Um, so I remember when you came out, we were talking about the idea of trying to do something with the hospital. This is before it was built. 
and the hospital um, was subsequently constructed um, and is um, on air source heat pumps, which is quite a surprise. Um, and we hear that the electricity bill is higher than they were expecting, which may be a function of COVID and they've got all the doors open or whatever you, they're doing at the moment. But I did wonder if you had any thoughts about the um, the, the, the practicalities of this and whether there's anything we could, we might be able to do to help them um, make sure that the, the energy costs are reasonable. And the reason I'm concerned about that is that, as I understand it, the it's a design and build and operate hospital. And so the contractors um, will be responsible for doing various things, but apparently the energy costs are simply a pass-through cost. Right. So whatever it costs to run, they simply give that bill to NHS or you know, say sign here, which doesn't seem to quite incentivize the contractor to do a particularly good job. No. So I was just wondering if there's anything with your experience you think we might be able to do to try and help them? Or, um, um, well, there was nobody too sensitive uh, on the call, but in some cases, uh, I think that old expression, if you can't polish a turd, springs to mind. Um, if they've made a bad job of it, um, they might be better um, taking fairly invasive action to, to fix it. Um, if the kit is the wrong size, that could be the problem. If the heat load is too high, either by design or by operation. <laughs> I remember sitting in traffic outside uh, Strathclyde Uni and the, the, there's, a, there's a college just been built on Cathedral Street um, opposite and there's a revolving door which is wonderful but it, this, it was taking the students too long to go through the revolving door and one of them hit the button that opens the, the wheelchair access door which is great you know good system but the door stays open and then as soon as somebody walks up to it it stays open again and it stays open again so the, this single swing door was open all the time so it's a little bit like uh when you see stuff being built and there's a there's a new pathway and it snakes from one place to the other but there's a nice bit of grass and it's the direct a to b route and without fail within two years there'll be a trodden path like we're all sheep across the grass taking a shortcut if somebody is taking a shortcut or the doors are open too much or something is wrong um they'll have a job fixing it it's really hard to go back and do things better um so without knowing the specifics of it, um, having tried to help the guys at the point where they're designing it, I think my expression at the time was they were asking for a heat pump that didn't exist on the market. Uh, they were wanting quite high temperatures. Um, the market moves all the time, of course, but I suspect it's probably a function of it just uh, running at far too high temperatures and wanting far too much heat demand because the building is, is leaking too much. Um, uh, not sure who, if anybody from here is on any side of the equation here, but um, the lawyers will get involved at some point, and that's always an expensive route. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, somebody asking about hydrocarbon ammonia uh, pumps. Yeah. To Alistair, Alistair Morton. Alistair. Alistair, yeah. do you want, so, sorry, do you want to introduce yourself in terms of what you've done, because you've done the seesaw stuff as well? Yeah, uh, Alistair Morton, I'm the energy officer with uh, Orton Islands Council. So uh, we have we have looked at uh, doing some, well, we've, we've put a, a CSO heat pump in from this, which is not quite finished yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> but uh, my my question was just about the, the ammonia and the, the hydrocarbon uh, systems and, and whether that's that's something that like, our, our refrigeration engineers can train to to odds or is it a, a completely different field it sounds you know the the I've, I've seen ammonia fridge plant before and it's got quite a lot of safety equipment associated with it and i was wondering how how easy it is to to convert oh it's a really deep question um broadly speaking our apprentices go to college for four years and uh, hvac apprentices using hfc's and, and such like go for three years. So it's not a big step forwards, but it's it's probably a step forward in terms of um, safety methodology and method statements and training and all the rest of it. Um, but it's not impossible. Um, it, it's not to say that um, ammonia heat pumps might be the right way to do it. They might not be. Um, depends on the size of the system, the temperature of the system. Um, there's a there's a there's always a shift going on in wh what working fluids to use. You know, the, the obvious one everybody knows of is CFCs and they're long gone now in most of the world. Um, it's just evolving all the time. Um, 
there are no perfect working fluids. They've all got some sort of flaw in their in their makeup. Um, but yeah, any anybody could train. The one that does worry me a little bit is the hydrocarbons. And uh, in between HFCs and hydrocarbons are a new blend called HFOs, um, which are mildly flammable. I worry that people treat these because it's copper pipe and it kind of looks the same, that they treat them as if they're non-flammable because um, uh, that's a route to a, a, an accident, unfortunately. Um, so uh, be wary, I think, of um, working fluids and, and making assumptions as to what the... Uh, the safety uh, protocol ought to be, um, as I say, that the, the, the in-betweeners are the ones to be very careful of because they, they, they don't kind of show enough um, danger signs, but somebody will um, make a mistake with them, I think. Um, there's, been, there's been various cases around the world. So it's an interesting Google, but people charging car air conditioning with uh, the wrong stuff for blends that are meant to be non-flammable but aren't they're still mildly flammable and invariably um some somebody uh, makes a mistake and there's an explosion so um it's it's just properly trained right method statements i think um so i, I hope that's I hope that's a reasonable answer no that's that's good it's it's not beyond the, the bounds of possibility no, no, and no, i no, think no. the uh the 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 good thing about these, these systems is that we're looking at higher temperatures and the higher temperatures is always the, the problem. We, we always have huge problems with our uh, domestic hot water in our buildings. And that's, you know, and the heat pumps that we've installed to date, we can, we can do the heating, no problem. But the hot water always ends up costing us a fortune and we always end up using far too much grid electricity. So, you know, being able to, to look at higher temperatures is would be a great, great boon. Yeah, there's small CO2 heat pumps that are excellent for making hot water. They're not brilliant for radiators, but they're, they're excellent for hot water, hot water heating. Um, equally, you know, perhaps, perhaps the hot water ought to just be direct electric. Um, you know, lots of buildings don't use very much, but have uh, plenty of um, capacity for making it. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. I think... You, you've drawn me to make a point, which is what will, what working fluids will heat pumps tend to use in the future? I have a fairly strong feeling that um, all domestic heat pumps will end up as hydrocarbons one way or another. We'll, we'll, we'll put in the effort to get over the safety issues of using uh, propane, for example. Um, you know, pretty high chance that everybody in this call, their domestic fridge is actually using isobutane R600A which is a hydrocarbon. Um, it's a very limited, small charge. And as you do bigger systems, it gets harder. But we're now seeing people uh, work out how to do six kilowatt heat pumps using uh, propane. Um, equally, if you put the heat pump outside, you can use as much as you like and it'll be fine because it's always too windy. So um, you wouldn't get an explosion uh, um, at cocktail. So um, we should probably move on. I'm conscious uh, I'm probably... Uh, keeping folk away from uh, at Coronation Street or whatever's on at eight o'clock, but... Um, We've got um, David Craig next, Dave. David Craig? Hello, yes. Yeah, you, you, you want to ask about increased ventilation for COVID? Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a response to Neil's question of what might be causing a higher than expected electricity bill in the hospital. And I just know that there's been a push to increase ventilation rates in places like the hospital, uh, which doesn't have windows, and that would probably increase the heating bill. Yeah, it it it, it might do. Um, I'm just I'm just hopeful that 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 is what the problem is. Um, I, I generally worried about their contracting strategy for the hospital and not incentivising the contraction. I think that they've. Um, I, th I think they went for the PR rather than the practicality on some of that stuff. But it, but it'll be interesting to see. That's why I was curious to know if there are there are, there are things that can be done. Well, the other, the other thought is to say, well, they f they didn't fit a heat pump to the hospital in order to save money. They fitted it to save carbon dioxide. So, you know, what what you know what's what's the problem? Uh, well, what. 
One observation would be if they um, ducted the exhaust air towards the heat pump, uh, obviously take care of any sort of uh, filtration, etc. But um, you know, throwing warm air off the roof and then trying to take uh, air heat out of fresh air, you know, 20, 30 meters away, doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about you know you you you've got to scavenge from the warmest place you can find. So some simple duct work, you know, harnessing that that better grade of of exhaust air would you could improve the efficiency of a heat pump because uh, the exhaust air will be circa 21 degrees and the ambient air will be circa 10 most of the year, 5, 10. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're probably talking 20% saving if you if you put the heat pump in the right place. Interesting. Bit of a uh, wrinkly tin, wrinkly tin, that, that'll fix it. Um, Martin Lee next. Sorry. Uh, your mind was, you're talking about the uh, potential issues with the fluid being flammable and so on. But my understanding is the fluid remains within the heat pump. You've only got cold water with antifreeze feeding it from the source of the heat and hot water going out, feeding it into the building. Is that correct? Or? You, you are correct, but like all things, there's always a bad day some point around the corner. And if it leaked into that room, then the the working fluid would be creating a, a an explosive atmosphere. So, um, so the ones where that's outside would be all right. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, you know, um, providing all of it is outside. Um, some heat pumps, there's a bit outside, but there's a bit inside still connected by the working fluid. Sometimes it's a, a glycol circuit between them. Uh, sometimes it's water, but with antifreeze dump valves, um, different ways of doing it. But the, the working fluid ought not to be indoors if it's flammable above a certain quantity um, right, and okay. not properly ventilated. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, has anyone else got any questions? Um, I, I would just like to make one, one point that I was going to make earlier on. In terms of curtailment within Orkney, while the, the, the total, somebody said, was 16% or something round about there, the large majority, more than 80% of customers in Orkney don't live in a curtailed zone. So moving those 80% of customers over to electric uh, vehicles will not help with curtailment. So that's uh, a, that's a like, distribution question in Orkney then, that the distribution needs to be better. Yeah. As in, well, the, the, curtailment, the curtailment isn't on the main, mainland connections, the curtailment's on internal circuits within Orkney, principally the ones from the Orkney mainland to the Orkney North Isles. Yeah, Martin, I, I was going to have my hand up and then I just withdrew it because we talked quite a lot of curtailment. I didn't want to slow it down. But yeah, completely for Dave's purposes, the good stuff that everyone talks about, the free stuff that everyone wants, is intermittent and geographically local. There's two things, and uh, exactly as Martin's saying, there's, there's no there's no free gravy. So, and But what is curtailed in Orton? You say at what price? Because there's also different things and different levels of curtailment, as Neil says, you know, Devices, devices not being built, <laughs> devices not running, and there's a whole range of it. But the, when you talk about that free stuff, as Martin says, it's an intermittent, so you can't rely on it on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's in very specific areas. And as you say, the best thing of all is let's build some grid into the centres where we can use it. But that's mm -hmm. a, a separate issue. I agree completely, Martin. I, I just, I just, I just shut up because I didn't want to be talking too much. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. You did ask about. I had my hand up about that. No, thank, thank you for that, Mark. Um, yeah, we, hey, we've got a we've got a cable from Norway to to um, Blythe and Northumberland now, so um, it would seem possible to increase the size of a cable if there's enough going down it to to make it pay. You think? Uh, Susan Kirkbride had a question. Not really a question. I think it's just a, a conundrum, really, at the moment about this tension between um, heating a building with a heat pump and then having to open the windows when people gather because of ventilation and sanitising and all the rest of it. It's, um, it's just a, I, don't know, I think a pain we have to live with at the moment, perhaps. 
it just seems crazy, but I don't think there's anything we can do about it. It was yeah, just when know. we had the comment about ventilation, that was all. No, no, it's a, it's a good point, Susan. I don't know how long it's, it's going to stay with us. Um, I think uh, longer term, or if the building was being re redone again, perhaps some sort of uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery system uh, would be the thing to fit. Um, but that's not an easy thing at all to, to mm. stir into an existing building. But yeah, you know, forced ventilation uh, brings the ventilated air to a space that you can then capture it as opposed to windows dotted all around the place. Um, mm. So yeah, tricky one. Um, it is, yeah, it was just a, a conundrum, a comment really, that was all. Thank you. If I could suggest something, Susan, perhaps the etiquette for, uh, for having a meeting like that is that people should take a jersey. Instead of taking a bottle of wine, they should come with a jersey and not expect <laughs> it to be hot. Indeed. <laughs> Mark Hull's got his hand up. Yeah. No, just after the wish, I mean, just to, uh, other things I was thinking, Dave, I know you say there isn't a house in the UK that you can't heat with a heat pump. And I would love I would love it to be otherwise, but we're literally just finishing a reasonably large project where we've actually done some really detailed monitoring of houses and tried to take an argument as part of a European project to say, look, put in a heat pump, it's going to decarbonise, it's going to be efficient. We are struggling. I would say the caveat is that's not too economically at the moment. I know it's I know there's reasons up against uh, the work against it and all the rest that we you can't beat insulation, you can't beat mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, and I'm just really nervous about that. We 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 had a situation with district heating um, about a decade and a half ago where it got a really bad reputation across Scotland because there were some bad ones put in and it nearly ruined the sector. We've had a couple, I mean, Alistair's on the call here, we've had a couple, I'm not pointing to Alistair, he does really good jobs, but we, we, both, we both had to deal with a situation where a heat pump had put in a, a, a not ideal building, um, and then we had to deal with the consequences after us. We had the insanity of someone putting one in a black house in the island of Lewis, if you know where they are with thatch roof, and it's just, I mean, I think that there's a matter of, I'm just really cautious, I'm just really cautious to oversell it to the people here as well. I'm a huge fan of heat pumps, really want them in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, no, just Mark, for that point Mark you're... Yeah. To totally right. Uh, I didn't say uh, yeah. cheaper than gas, uh, but <laughs> technically, technically, you can raise heat from a heat pump. And yeah, you know the bad houses. Let's just pick in a really bad. Way. Maybe it's the, the black house and, uh, and Lewis. Whatever. Uh, you know the COP might only be two to one, but why are we testing ourselves versus a fuel that at some point isn't going to be available? Yeah, no, but we have we have that issue at the moment. We have people that, I and mean, we have people with a huge amount of fuel, fuel poverty as well. And the recent publicity locally as well, where someone was complaining they couldn't put an oil boiler back in, and we don't want it. This is a, we're, we're we're passionate about that not happening. But when it actually means that's the economic option for their house, then that's a significant thing because they can't rebuild their house. They can't put in MVHR and all those sort of things, you know, into, into their property. They just need to they do it affordably. And we're wrestling with that at the moment. I know, I, I just... I, 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 and, and so tell me this though, if electricity costs 5p to make and there's some yeah. transmission charges, why couldn't there be a, a, a special tariff for, for heat pumps? They've got it in Italy. Um, well, that, that's that's a whole other that with, with the people around the room here. There's a whole other evening meeting on that. Dave. We we chatted. We chatted about five years ago when you were up here as well. I'm a, I yeah. I'm a huge fan of doing that. We do local supply and make the best, especially with things like curtailed energy or, or things like that, and save using transmission. But I'm not I'm not going to bash them for the for the actual costs that we do. That makes the difference between the five and the fifteen at the moment. You know, I mean, there's 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 good reasons for that. Um, we have to completely rewire the market to allow us to do it. And um, we would love that. I don't think we're going to do it just in Orkney, though. Yeah. OK, I think that's um, the end of the questions. An absolutely fascinating session, Dave. I'm so pleased you came on. And I'm looking forward to Orkney Council looking how they're going to build one in Hatson to support the new developments to the west of Orkney. Um, That'd be Alistair for over you, I think. I did see it on the plan for 2017 to 2022 on the district plan. It does show a heat pump, see heat pump in Hatson. So I'm not just making this up. No, no, no. It's a, we've got, always got plans for district heating, but they just <laughs> never get there. <laughs> so Patsy's giving it a push. Um, 
before we um, go, I think Neil, Neil, you wanted to make a, a wee announcement while everyone's still on. Yeah, just a, a good chance while we're here. Um, something's happening rather unexpectedly. Um, as a result of the last ORF meeting, Mark kindly got in touch with a, a chap who was a world expert in the idea of using kelp as an additive to animal feed to reduce the enteric um, uh, methane emissions from cows. And since they're a major contributor to carbon dioxide, uh, to um, climate change, um, it could well be something that's important. Um, as it turned out, this guy is from California. He happens to be in Scotland at the moment. And basically, we think we're just about to have talked him into coming up and giving a presentation on Monday. So this, um, at the moment, we're running around in circles, getting everybody uh, mobilised about it. And we've spoken to uh, people who are involved in the NFU. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the plan at the moment is actually to give the presentation at the, the Mart um, on Monday night. We'll, we'll work out some details because I'm not sure how many people we can have in there, but we will be Zoom. Can you zoom cast it? Is that a thing? Anyway, um, yeah, okay. So, so the plan is we'll record it and uh, cast it, but it's uh, another way of tackling the um, emission side from the, you know, from the cow end of the problem. But the other point is it may actually also be a mechanism in terms of kelp farming as another industry and or the kelp drying process using waste heat, et cetera, et cetera. So watch this space, more announcements in due course, keep your eye on Facebook, et cetera. It's not a, it's not a done deal at the moment, but it's looking promising. I watch this space. Yep. Yeah. Right. So I think that concludes tonight's session. Um, I think it's been really encouraging. Um, and I'm so in favour of us going for district heating. I'm very excited that we can actually do something. So let's see what we can do to make it happen in Orkney. Uh, we can't be jealous of Glasgow. That's terrible, isn't it? That'd be really bad. They'd get one ahead of us. Oh, it was Clyde um, Bank. It was Clyde Bank. I'm, I'm always at pains to say it. it wasn't Glasgow. It was Clyde Bank. Oh, that, does that make any better? I'm not sure it does, really. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Home of wait, wait. <laughs> Plenty of water. So thank you very much, Dave. And, yeah, thank you. Um, nice thanks to everyone for joining. All. Lovely to see yeah. you all. Nice, thanks to the questions. That was, that was absolutely super. Sure. And thank hopefully we'll have a session on Monday to see thanks, people. Thanks, Dave. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Dave. That was great. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.